So, let's be honest. It feels like every newspaper, podcast and TV broadcast focusing on football has covered every angle of Jurgen Klopp's shocking resignation as Liverpool manager. Over the next five months, I'm sure there will be thousands of articles written on potential successors. However, I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to look back at other high-profile examples of iconic managers leaving after long spells in the dugout and see if there are any consistent approaches clubs have made in replacing these legends to great success or failure. We must first begin with the longest managerial reign in professional football history, all the way back in 1948. With West Brom icon Fred Everest. Appointed in 1902, Everest's spell lasted over 46 years and two world wars in a career that can hardly be believed. Everest committed his life to West Brom, first working for the club at just 14 as an office boy, where he oversaw minor jobs such as preparing match programs and other administrative activities. His reputation and stature in the club was profound, so much so that at just 20 years of age he was appointed the club's secretary manager, following the club's first ever relegation. This role typically focuses on more financial and administrative roles within a football club, but at the time West Brom had no manager, so Everest had the responsibility to both coach the team and run the football club. A reminder, he was doing this at just 20 years of age. In his first season, he oversaw West Brom's return to the top division, winning the league by four points over Middlesbrough, with his first season back in the top flight continuing his impressive start to management, finishing seventh in the league just six points off the top. Unfortunately, the next season would see them return to the second division, having finished bottom in the league. This would begin a disappointing seven-year period of consecutive seasons in the second tier. However, according to all available reports at the time, there was never any consideration of Everest ever leaving his post. They finally returned to the top flight in 1911, where they would stay until football was suspended due to the outbreak of the First World War. Football returned after a four-season absence in 1919 to a completely different landscape. Many of the game's top players had either died, been injured, or were no longer of a playing football age, and there was a lot of uncertainty around which team had the best players and could challenge for the league title. Fred Everest thrived in this environment, putting together the best team in the division, romping to their first ever league title by nine points, scoring 104 goals in the process, 37 of which were were scored by inside forward Fred Morris. He was unable to repeat the title, however, with them ultimately falling to relegation in 1927. They returned to the league in 1931. However, this season was remembered for them becoming one of just eight teams to ever win the FA Cup outside the top flight in the Football League's 136-year history, winning the final 2-1 against the Birmingham outfit in front of 92,000 people in Wembley, with their iconic centre-forward William Ginger Richardson scoring both goals in the final. Everest would continue to manage the Baggies up until the Second World War, spending the majority of the 30s in the top flight. He would manage West Brom for two consecutive 7th place finishes in the 2nd Division following the end of the Second World War, before finally retiring in 1948 at 66 years of age following a 46-year spell as the club's secretary manager. Everest would be appointed to the club's board following his retirement, where he would remain until his untimely death in 1951. Fred's son Alan also committed his life to the club, first joining the club's staff in 1933, before later following his father's footsteps by becoming the club's secretary, director and a life member, a position which he held up until 1999. Following Fred's retirement in 1948, the club disbanded the role of secretary manager, in favour of splitting the roles to two different people as it was seen as impossible for any one person to be qualified and capable enough to do both of these jobs at the same level that Fred Everest had achieved for almost half a century. The club appointed Jack Smith as manager, his first management role following having his playing career at Chelsea cut short following having his foot crushed by a bus during a blackout in Wolverhampton. At the first time of asking, the unexperienced Smith would lead Albion back to the top flight where they would remain for the next 24 years. However, Fred Everest is still the only man to lead West Brom to a top-flight title. This brings us on to our next manager, who took over Manchester United immediately after the Second World War and held the job for a trophy-littered 24 years. This is the iconic Sir Matt Busby, father of the Busby babes and the man who led an English club to the European Cup for the first time. Busby, unknown to many, spent much of his playing career playing for United's two great rivals, Manchester City and Liverpool, 
playing 227 and 122 games for them both respectively. It was Liverpool where he was working as an assistant coach when in 1945 Manchester United offered him the role as their manager. Despite already winning two league titles, Manchester United had spent much of the 30s in the second division and had teed bankruptcy on multiple occasions. This was by no means a club comparable to the Manchester United we know today. There were no guarantees that the future of the club would be in the top division, let alone be the best in the country. Busby was the first manager to be fully committed to bringing through players from Manchester United's academy, a practice that the club would be renowned for ever since. The strategy brought immediate success for Busby, winning the 1948 FA Cup with six academy products in the starting 11. It took till his sixth season to finally claim the club's third league title, following four second place finishes in his first five seasons. The consistency of top place finishes was extremely rare in the first half of the 20th century due to an extremely volatile football landscape. With Busby's commitment to the academy and sharp focus for man management being attributed to his success, Manchester United would win the first five versions of the FA Youth Cup, with these players beginning to flood into the first team during the 50s, earning the nickname the Busby Babes. This team consisted of the likes of Bobby Charlton, Duncan Edwards and Dennis Violet, with this team having great success for the club, winning back-to-back -back titles midway through the decade. He also defied the FA's wishes by being the first English club to compete in the European Cup in 1956-57 where they reached the semi-final, eventually being knocked out by De Stefano's Real Madrid. However, European glory seemed inevitable for this young Manchester side. The next season looked like it could be their year, reaching the semi-final after knocking out Red Star Belgrade. However, De Staster would strike on their way back from the quarter-final. Their aeroplane crashed whilst trying to refuel at Munich Airport, killing 21 passengers, including 8 players and 3 members of staff. One of those players was Duncan Edwards a 21-year-old who was regarded as the best talent in English game, better than even Bobby Charlton, and would have surely gone on to be one of England's greatest ever footballers if his life wasn't snatched away from him. Busby was seriously injured from the crash, spending weeks in hospital before finally being released. However, Busby wanted to resign, blaming himself for the crash due to him being the main man pushing Manchester United to compete in Europe. Thankfully, he was persuaded to stay on, beginning the greatest revival story in English football history. The survivors of the crash, in addition to the emergence of players such as Nobby Stiles, David Sadler and the great George Bess, helped lead the club back to glory, winning the league title again as early as 1965 before completing their fairy tale story by winning the European Cup a decade after the Munich disaster. In front of a full Wembley Stadium, all four goals were scored by academy players, two of which were scored by disaster survivor and the club's greatest player, Bobby Charlton. And it was just a year later, in 1969, that Matt Busby shocked the world by announcing he would retire at the end of the season. Busby explained his decision to retire, saying that you can go on playing for so long, but one day you have to stop. The demands are just beyond one human being. He also announced the decision before the end of the season, so the club could have enough time to find his replacement. Like with Everest, Busby was made a director of the club following his retirement. Manchester United without Busby was unimaginable to many people, and the club were facing a neon impossible task to find its replacement. Busby, eerily like what would happen 44 years later, hadn't picked his replacement in Wilf McGuinness. A member of the Busby Babes, he was not on the plane that fateful day due to an injury, but has spoken about the effect the disaster had on his life. After his playing career ended at just 22, Busby invited McGuinness to coach the reserve team, which he did, playing an important role in the progression of some of Manchester United's great academy products, including George Best. McGuinness was still only 31 when he was appointed manager, and was sacked halfway through his second season in charge, after finishing 8th in his one full season, despite reaching two cup semi-finals during his short period. Busby briefly came out of retirement for the remainder of that season before handing the reins to Francis O'Farrell for the 1971-72 season. He would once again fail to live up to the Busby legacy, with his successor Tommy Doherty completing the downfall of the once great side by getting relegated just six years after winning the European Cup. Manchester United would not win another league title until 1993 under Sir Alex Ferguson, 
less than a year before Matt Busby died in 1994. From a manager who was failed to be adequately replaced for decades after his departure, to a manager in Miguel Munoz, who despite being Real Madrid's most decorated and longest serving coach ever, had an exit celebrated after seasons of decline. Munoz and former Real Madrid captain, who was part of their first three European Cup winning sides, before retiring in 1958 when he transitioned into coaching the reserve side. Despite their unprecedented European dominance, Real Madrid president Santiago Bernabeu was renowned for being a trigger happy with his managers, totaling eight different managers during the 1950s alone. Therefore, when it looked likely that the new kid on the block, Barcelona, were going to win a second successive title in 1960, Bernabeu sacked manager, handing the main job to Munoz. Munoz endeared himself to the Real Madrid faithful as a manager straight away, by beating Barcelona over two legs in the European Cup semi-final 6-2, before completing the task in one of the best European Cup finals ever. In front of 127,000 people at Hampton Park, Real Madrid defeated Eintracht Frankfurt 7-3 with Ferenc Puskas scoring four and Alfredo de Stefano three. Following this season, Real Madrid was stove off Barcelona's threats by winning five consecutive league titles. However, their European success would begin to wane with Eusebio's Benfica and a Spanish FA ban on signing foreign players playing a major part in their drought. However, Munoz oversaw a rapid rebuild after having a public and nasty fallout with de Stefano. He left for Espanyol whilst Puskas began to be phased out of the team. Other members of the European Cup winners were also moved on, with Munoz doing a great job at recruiting the best talent across Spain. This was exemplified by their sixth European Cup win in 1966, once again establishing themselves as Europe's best side. The European glory would be backed up by three more league titles to end off a dominant decade. However, the 1970s would bring in a change of fortune for Munoz. The first two seasons of the decade saw them slump to fourth and fifth, their slowest finishes for two decades. They did sneak a league title in 1972 by two points, however another fourth place finish followed up by a season lingering in fifth, whilst their great rivals Barcelona were running away with the league title, led by new record signing Johan Cruyff, so Real Madrid fans turn on Munoz. Chants of Munoz out could be heard across the stadium leading Munoz to hand in his letter of resignation in January 1974, following a defeat to bottom-placed Castellón. Looking back, Munoz is considered a legend of Real Madrid, due to winning a combined 13 league titles and five European Cups as a player and manager. Former player and a current director, Luis Maloney, took charge of the team in another example of a club looking from within to maintain a consistency of culture following an icon's departure. Unfortunately for the president Santiago Bernabeu, this culture had become stale and Maloney only made things worse for Los Blancos, finishing the season in 8th, including losing to their great rivals Barcelona 5-0 at home. Bernabeu ripped things up, deciding the club needed a culture change, deciding on the highly acclaimed Red Star Belgrade manager, Milan Milanic, who had dominated Serbian football and punched well above his weight in Europe famously knocking out a great Liverpool side. Milanic brought a new level of professionalism to Real Madrid, being credited with hiring the club's first ever fitness coach and spending much more time focused on the tactical elements of the game. This brought instant success for Real Madrid, winning back-to-back -back league titles and reclaiming their grip over Spanish football, highlighting a key example of a club improving, following an icon's exit. However, the next club, Tottenham, saw a sharp decline following the departure of their longest standing and most successful manager ever, Bill Nicholson. A member of Spurs' first league winning side in 1951, Nicholson became part of the club's coaching staff once he retired in 1955. Three years later, he was appointed the club's manager, with Spurs sitting in the bottom third of the table. Nicholson was a man famed for playing the best football in the land and led Spurs to their second league title in 1960-61, also becoming the first team in the 20th century to complete an FA Cup and league double. Spurs built upon this success by signing Jimmy Greaves for £99,999 for a British record fee. Nicholson insisted on this bizarre price so that Greaves didn't become the first ever British footballer to be sold for six figures, and this works with wonders. Greaves would score 266 goals for Spurs, a record until last year, when Harry Kane broke it. Greaves still remains the top scorer in English top flight history, highlighting the quality of play Spurs were adding to an already dominant side. They would go on to defend their FA Cup crown the following season, and may well have become the first British side to win the European Cup that same season, if it wasn't for some questionable refereeing decisions in their semi-final matchup with Benfica. 
But Nicholson would make a mark on European soil, helping Spurs to be the first English club to win a European trophy in 1963 when they beat Atletico Madrid 5-1 to win the Cup Winners Cup. He also won the inaugural UEFA Cup in 1972, beating out fellow English sides Wolves in the final over two legs. A burnt out Nicholson retired in 1974, following a 16 year spell in the dugout in which he won 9 trophies. He wanted his league title winning captain and club icon Donny Blanchfell to replace him as manager and Johnny Giles to be appointed as a player coach. But chairman Sidney Whale was angered by Nicholson contacting the pair without informing him first. The club severed all ties with Nicholson, even though he wanted to stay on as an advisor. The treatment of Nicholson was not received well by Spurs fans. Therefore, when Whale opted to hire Arsenal legend Terry Neal over Blanchfell, there was a great discontent in the fan base. Neal was never accepted across his two disappointing seasons in charge, with his style of football also being the antithesis of what Nicholson and Tottenham stood for. In his first season in charge, it took a miracle to avoid a first relegation since 1935 with them beating Europe King Cup finalist Leeds 4-1 on the last day of the season to survive. Neil completed his villainous time as Tottenham manager by leaving the club to return to Arsenal as manager. He would get replaced by his assistant Keith Birkinshaw, who couldn't prevent Tottenham from getting relegated in his first season in charge. Despite relegation, Birkinshaw was loved by the fans as he played in the Tottenham way and ensured Nicholson returned to the club as a consultant. Spurs would bounce straight back up and with the assistance of Argentinian World Cup winning pair Ricky Villa and Ozzy Ardiles would return as one of England's most dangerous cup sides. Birkinshaw would win two FA Cups and a UEFA Cup in his eight years at the club, leaving as the club's second most decorated manager. From two iconic Tottenham managers to two iconic Liverpool ones, we first have Bill Shankly. The most significant figure in Liverpool's history, Shankly took over as Liverpool manager in December 1959, midway through the club's fifth consecutive season in the second division. Having failed to get the job in 1951, Shankly had accrued a decade's worth of managerial experience by the time he became manager. Liverpool was a club on their knees, knocked out the FA Cup by non-league side Worcester City at the season prior, not looking likely to return to the first division anytime soon. Shankly was an extremely demanding man, which had caused him to fall out with boards at two of his previous clubs. This was also true at Liverpool, with him demanding investment into both Anfield and the club's training ground Melwood, getting them in line with modern standards, as well as clashing with the board over investment into the playing staff. There was ultimately mass squad turnover, as Shankly was extremely unhappy with the quality of squad made available to him, with 24 players that he had placed on the transfer list, ending up leaving within a year of him being at the club. He also put together one of the most memorable backroom staffs in football history as part of the famous boot room, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan and Ruben Burnett. Paisley was credited with being the mastermind behind the team's tactics, whereas Shankly was more the motivator and orator of the team, connecting with most of the Liverpool fan base. After two consecutive third place finishes and team consisting of Roger Hunt, Ian St. John, Ron Yates, Ian Callaghan, and Ronnie Moran, left Liverpool back to the first division. A club United took to the top division by storm, finishing eighth in their first season before winning the league in just their second season back in the top division. Credited with being the fittest team in the country during an era of mass drinking and poor diet, this Liverpool era became iconic. Shankly would win a further two league titles and claim the club's first two FA Cups and a European trophy in his 15 year spell at the club transforming Liverpool from a sleeping giant into a dominant force of English football. He shocked the world when he announced his retirement in 1974, following the club's second FA Cup crown. Like with many of these iconic managers, after over a decade managing Liverpool, Shankly was burnt out, and with the support of his family, he made the decision to step down. However, this was a decision he would come on to regret, often returning to Melwood to watch training, occasionally even taking over the training session. It got to a point where he had to be banned from the training ground, however Shankly continued to give advice to any Liverpool manager or player who asked for it. As his replacement, both the club and Shankly agreed that Bob Paisley was the perfect candidate. Having worked as an assistant for 15 years and been taken under the wing as a youngster at Liverpool by an experienced Matt Busby, Paisley had all the credentials to be a success at Liverpool and would maintain continuity from the club's most successful period. However, he was reluctant to take the job. A quiet man, Paisley didn't feel he had the gravitas to replace the larger-than-life character of Shankly. 
He even tried to persuade Shankly to rethink his decision to retire. However, after Shankly refused to return, Paisley reluctantly took the job as Liverpool manager. Nine years later, he retired as the most successful manager in English football history at that point of time, having led Liverpool to six league titles, three European Cups, one UEFA Cup and three League Cups, having won a trophy in every season he was at the club. With the likes of Kenny Dalglish, Ian Rush, Graeme Souness and Kevin Keegan, Paisley built on Shankly's brilliance to transform Liverpool from a giant of the English game to a true European giant. Paisley retired at the end of the 82-83 season, having spent 44 years at the club as a player, coach and manager. Liverpool approached replacing Paisley with the if it ain't broke, don't fix it strategy once again handing the job to the club's reluctant assistant manager, this time Joe Fagan, another member of Liverpool's famed boot room. Fagan was also a quiet man who never searched for the limelight despite being part of Shankly's and Paisley's backroom staff. Fagan would be the first manager to ever win three major trophies in his first season in charge, winning the league, league cup and the club's fourth European cup in eight years. He would retire at the end of just his second season, bringing an end to an era of 25 years in which the Liverpool dugout was solely made up of Bill Shankly and members of his staff, and showed one of the most successful examples of replacing iconic managers in English football history. However, Paisley's great rival and Nottingham Forest's most iconic figure, Brian Clough, has never been truly replaced. The complete antithesis to Paisley, Clough is one of the biggest personalities in English football history. His supporters would call him charismatic, confident and funny. His aiders would call him arrogant and deluded. An already established name in the game by the time he joined Forest in 1975, having led Derby County from the second division to win the first division in just five years. He was also well known for making TV appearances on a regular basis, where he was by no means media trained. I would love a few chairmen on your programme occasionally. I believe the very sight of them brings the game into disrepute. <laughs> and every time, every time they open the mouths, it kills it. It was as if Jose Mourinho went on Super Sunday every other week whilst he was still managing Manchester United and having a go at other clubs, players and owners in the Premier League. His talk even got the attention of the great Muhammad Ali. There's some fella in London, England named some Bran, uh, Bran Clough, some soccer player or something. I heard all the way in Indonesia that this fella talks too much. They say he's another Muhammad Ali. There's just one Muhammad Ali. I'm the talker. Now, Clough, I've had enough. Stop it. Well, are you going to stop it? <laughs> no, I want to fight him. <laughs> Therefore, after a disastrous spell of just 44 days at Leeds, where he was deeply unpopular due to his previous comments criticising their former boss Don Revy, Clough found himself having to settle for a job in the bottom half of the second division. Even at Forest, four committee members threatened to resign when they heard Clough was being considered as manager. However, the club with only two major trophies in their history were desperate for success and knew Clough was capable of achieving this. However, things didn't go according to plan early on, finishing 16th in his first season, including a 15-game winless spell. His second season saw them once again linger near the bottom of the table. However, turn of form saw them finish the season in 8th, beginning Forrest's upward trajectory. In this summer, Clough's trusted assistant at Derby, Peter Taylor, rejoined his coaching staff. He was renowned for his talent identification, being the man responsible for building the great Derby side that won the league title. When he arrived in Nottingham, he told Clough that that was a feat by you to finish 8th in the 2nd Division, because some of them are only 3rd Division players. However, Taylor did recognise the talents of John Robertson, a winger who was overweight and lazy, with him making it his mission to get the best out of Robertson, as he believed he could be the player who could lead Nottingham to great things. With Taylor's eye for talent, the quality of squad improved drastically, and at the third time of asking, Brian Clough led Nottingham Forest to the first division, despite only getting the fifth fewest points for a promoted team in league history. Therefore, going into the top division, Nottingham Forest were expected to go straight back down. However, in the summer, Taylor convinced Clough to sign Kenny Burns, an aggressive centre-back with a bad reputation, the type of player that Brian Clough would often criticise in the media. They would also break the transfer record for a goalkeeper by signing England goalkeeper Peter Shilton. Expectations around Forrest had begun to rise, however nobody could have expected them to double their major trophy count in just one season, winning both a League Cup and a League title. John Robertson was a star-wide player, whilst Kenny Burns was voted Player of the Season. However, Clough had always stated he wanted to win the European Cup, 
largely due to the fact his rival, Don Revy, had never won it, and that he would. After defeating Paisley's back-to-back winning European Cup winners in the first round, Forrest would defeat AEK Athens, Grasshoppers and Cologne to set up a final in Munich against Swedish champions Malmö. Forrest would complete the miracle thanks to a 45th minute goal by Trevor Francis, Britain's first million pound footballer. What is even more impressive is that Forrest would defend their title the following season, meaning by the time they had completed their third season back in the top flight, they had won two European Cups, two League Cups, a Super Cup and a League title. Top players were then sold on, however, and their replacements were never at the same quality. Taylor retired, having lost confidence in his scouting ability, and later had a falling out with Clough when he unretired to manage Derby County and took John Robertson with him. Clough continued to have success at Nottingham Forest, finishing near the top of the league and even winning two more League Cups. However, he began to struggle with an alcoholic addiction in the early 90s, which came to a disastrous conclusion in the first season of the Premier League. Having finished in the top half in 14 of their 15 seasons back in the top flight, nobody could have predicted them to get relegated in their inaugural Premier League season. But following the sale of star Teddy Sheringham and a number of injuries, they found themselves bottom of the Premier League at the season's end, bringing an end to Nottingham Forest's longest spell in the top tier and Clough's managerial career. Clough wanted his assistant Ron Fenton to replace him in charge, but the club instead opted for their former player and European Cup winner, Frank Clark. Clark had a promotion under his belt with Leighton Orient and was much loved by the club's fan base, with his first three seasons in charge of Forest being truly magical, earning promotion straight back to the Premier League, backed up by an incredible third place finish, earning them a place in the next season's UEFA Cup. In this, they would reach the quarter-finals, including getting a victory against the team they beat in their first European Cup final, Malmo. They also finished in the top half of the league, having seemingly cemented themselves back in the Premier League for years to come. However, the club's ownership didn't support Clark. They failed to invest in the squad and refused to give his coaching staff new contracts, which was the final straw for Clark, leading him to resign in December 1996. Already having an awful season, Clark's exit only condemned them to relegation, limiting them to just one more season in the Premier League in the next 25 years, until Steve Cooper led them back to the Premier League in 2022. The next iconic manager, Guy Rowe, is probably the least known of the managers I'll talk about today, but he probably is the man with the single most impact on a professional football club ever. Having dragged Auxerre from the regional leagues of French football, to being champions of France during a 39-year spell as manager between 1961 and 2000. A true Cinderella story at just 23, Rowe was appointed the manager of his local amateur club, Auxerre, sitting in the fifth tier of French football, despite no management experience and just a short football career in the club's academy. Reportedly, the main reason he was appointed was due to having the lowest salary demands of all the candidates. Working for an amateur club, Rue was responsible for almost every element of the football club, from coaching the side to scouting the players and even spending time persuading local farmers to donate manure for the pitch. His work ethic marked him apart from other managers straight away. However, early into his tenure between 1962 and 1964, he was away from the club due to military conscription. However, his return began a period of upward movement through the leagues, instilling a professional attitude within the club long before they were one, reaching a professional Ligue 2 in 1974, marking a rapid rise through the French football pyramid. Both Roux and the club's president, Jean-Claude Hamel, shared a belief that behind-the-scenes infrastructure was paramount to the club's long-term success an attitude that was perfectly showcased in 1980, when Auxerre rejected the chance to sign French international striker Oliver Rouillet in favour of opening a state-of-the-art youth academy. This would prove to be the correct decision, as over the next few years, players of the calibre of Eric Cantona, Basile Boli, and Pascal Varrois would come through the setup and establish themselves as regulars in the first team. Still in the second tier, they would reach the Coupe de France final in 1979 and progress to Ligue 1 in 1980, 19 years after Rue took charge. Many onlookers doubted whether such a small club would be able to sustain themselves in Ligue 1. But Rue, someone who had proven doubters wrong throughout his whole life, led Auger to a comfortable 10th place finish in their first season in Ligue 1. This form became consistent 
finishing in the top half in all but one of their first 13 seasons in Ligue 1, including qualifying for Europe on a regular basis, earning famous victories against AC Milan and Ajax. 1994 marked the year Auger would win their first major honour when they beat Montpellier 3-0 in the Coupe de France final. Two years later, Guy Roux would top off his fairy tale career by beating Monaco and PSG to earn the club's first ever Ligue 1 title, completing the rise from asking farmers for manure to French champions in a remarkable 35-year career. They would also lift a second Coupe de France that season, showcasing how determined and a frugal man can lift a club on his shoulders, breaking through all ceilings that were opposed to him. However, his success was not achieved without criticism, accused of being self-obsessed and acting like a tyrannical dictator who ruled Algier with an iron fist, having control over players' personal lives and setting expectations for staff to work outside of work hours. This would see him fail miserably later in his career when he moved to Lens. However, during his time at the club he built, he had earned so much respect and love from the fans that his old school approach never affected him, even as the world evolved. He retired from management in 2000, moving up to be the club's director of football, marking an end to a record-breaking 38-year managerial career of great success and unprecedented loyalty. The club opted for long-standing B-team coach Daniel Roland to be his replacement. Roland, a graduate of the club's academy, had worked as a coach at the club since 1973 and had been the B-team coach since 1977, where he had won 12 trophies in 23 years. Seen as someone who knew the club inside and out, would bring a great amount of continuity to the club, Roland seemed an obvious choice. However, he lasted just one season, in which he earned just the club's third bottom half finish in league history. And wouldn't you know it, 39 years after being appointed for the first time, Guy Roux was itching to return as manager. He reportedly didn't enjoy the hands-off role as a director of football and wanted to return to coaching. This re-energised Roux would once again lead Auger to four consecutive top eight finishes and more importantly, would win two more Coupe de France's before finally leaving his post for good in 2005. Having taken over as manager when Matt Busby was still at Manchester United and Franz Beckenbauer was yet to make his professional debut till finally retiring in the year Jose Mourinho won the title with Chelsea and Messi had made his Barcelona debut. Rue had completed his magnificent managerial career at Auxerre. As his replacement for the second time, the club opted for the highly acclaimed former France and Tottenham boss Jacques Santini. They would have a great start to the season but would fade to sixth, but more consequentially, a still heavily involved Rue would have a falling out with Santini. Santini had complained about the club's transfer policy, wanting more say in the decision making, leading him to be sacked after just one season in charge. They replaced him with Marseille manager Jean Fernandez, convincing the manager to quit the French Giants in favour of them, showcasing how far the club had come over the past 50 years. Fernandez would coach them for five years, qualifying for the Champions League once and finishing in the top half in all but one season. He would leave in 2011, having failed to agree terms on a new contract. This failure to get him to re-sign would end up being a fatal mistake by Auxerre. His replacement, Laurent Fournier, was a disaster, being sacked in March with the club sitting bottom of the table. This is where the club would remain, marking an end to the club's remarkable 32-year spell in Ligue 1 and the club's first ever relegation from the top flight. Auxerre would remain in the second division for 10 seasons before finally returning to Ligue 1 in 2022. The penultimate manager I'll be talking about today is by far the most successful manager in Premier League history. This is of course Sir Alex Ferguson. The figure that loomed over the first two decades of the Premier League so Alex Ferguson brought glory back to Manchester's biggest club. As Aberdeen manager, Ferguson was establishing himself as one of the most promising managers in the world, breaking the Rangers and Celtic duopoly in Scotland by winning back-to-back -back titles, and even more impressively, winning European silverware with the Scottish Minnows. They would win the 1983 Cup Winners' Cup, knocking out Bayern Munich in the quarterfinals, and then Real Madrid in the final, thanks to a 112th minute winner by John Hewitt. Across his eight years in Aberdeen, he would be approached to manage Rangers, Tottenham and Arsenal, but always opted to stay, allowing for a thought exercise of how different English football could have been if he joined one of the North London clubs. He finally left Aberdeen in November 1986 to replace Ron Atkinson in the Old Trafford dugout. As stated earlier, 
United hadn't won a title since Matt Busby's era. However, the club had now begun to establish themselves back at the top of the table of English football, having recorded five consecutive top four finishes. Although they were sitting 19th on the table when he took over, following a disastrous start to the season. He steadied the ship in the second half of the season, finishing 11th. Before a very impressive second place finish in his first full season in charge, following the signings of Viv Anderson, Brian McClare and Steve Bruce. The next two league seasons would be disastrous however, finishing 11th and 13th, with his job only being safe due to an impressive FA Cup run in the latter season. With there being reputable reports leaked before their third round tie with Brian Clough's Nottingham Forest, that he would be sacked if he was to lose. Manchester United fans were mainly in support of Ferguson, which was a major reason why he kept his job for so long, and thankfully they would win that fateful game against Nottingham Forest 1-0, beginning Ferguson's era of dominance. They would go on to beat Crystal Palace in an FA Cup final replay and would clinch the Cup Winners' Cup the following season. The final season before the Premier League would see them win the League Cup and Super Cup but miss out just on the league title to their rivals Leeds. But their first season back in the Premier League would see them end their 26-year title drought, easily beating out title rivals Aston Villa and Norwich to clinch the title by 10 points, beginning Ferguson's two decades of dominance winning the title in 13 of 21 seasons, in addition to two Champions Leagues, four more FA Cups, three more League Cups, and a two Club World Cups, whilst living up to Busby's legacies by building the team around some of the best academy products in recent memory. Ferguson initially announced his decision to retire at the beginning of the 0102 season, before revisiting that decision in January, since stating that decision to retire was the worst mistake of his career. He would in fact retire 11 years later after claiming his 13th and arguably most impressive title due to the lack of quality he had in comparison to previous squads. The squad's quality had begun to deplete largely due to the Glazer family who had gained full control of Manchester United in 2005, two years after buying their first shares in the club. These shares were largely acquired through loans which had been heavily criticised by long-term Manchester United Chief Executive David Gill with a large segment of United fans being opposed to the Glazers from the beginning. The first eight years of the Glazers were largely protected by Ferguson and Gill remaining at the club. However, both their exits in 2013 exposed the Glazers' ineptitude. The Glazers replaced Gill with Ed Woodward, the club's former head of commercial and media operations, with a background in investment banking. With no football experience, Woodward's eight years as CEO were unsurprisingly disastrous failing to employ a director of football and often overpaying on player wages and fees. However, it was Ferguson himself who handpicked his replacement, as like Busby had done so all those years previous. There was a lot of discourse about the replacing Ferguson with someone who knew the club. However, there were no standout candidates. Ferguson was renowned for churning through assistance, as he wanted to keep ideas and voices in the club fresh for the players, and there were no former players having a great time in football management. Future manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer was the only one discussed at all, having won titles in Norway and coached Man United's reserve side for three years. Ferguson opted for a fellow Scot, however, in David Moyes, who he had been a well-known fan of for many years. Having qualified for the Champions League and completed eight top seven finishes in 11 years at Everton, Moyes was one of the most respected managers in the Premier League. However, everything that could have gone wrong seemingly did, in Moyes' 10 months in charge of Manchester United. From the start, cutting ties with Ferguson's backroom staff was a massive error. In his final years at Manchester United, Ferguson took a step away from taking charge of training sessions and gave a lot of responsibility to his assistants. These people would have surely helped the transition and maintain a winning culture in the building, but Moyes rejected this notion in favour of bringing in his own team. He also didn't get the financial support he needed that summer. Reportedly wanting the likes of Gareth Bale, Seth Fabregas and Tony Cruz, Moyes ended up with his former player Mario Anfaloni as his only summer signing. There were many other problems for Moyes during his short spell in charge of United, from failing to gain respect of senior players to an inability to embed a style of play. Moyes was ultimately sacked following a loss to Everton in April, with Man United sitting 7th in the Premier League. The next decade would see Manchester United move from possession-based managers to counter-attacking ones, 
with poor signings after another continuing till today, with them failing to win a league or Champions League title since Ferguson left. Another club who failed to win a title since their iconic manager left is Arsenal, with Arsene Wenger. In a similar way to Munoz at Real Madrid almost 50 years previous, Wenger, in the eyes of many Arsenal fans, stayed long enough to become the villain. Having arrived as a relatively unknown on British shores, Wenger had been managing in Japan despite already winning a league title in France with Monaco. As could be imagined, the British press had a field day with Arsenal hiring a manager from the Japanese league. Arsene who became a term used by both the media and Arsenal fans. However, it didn't take long for Wenger to shut all his doubters up. Through being the man responsible for bringing modern professionalism to English shores and his amazing recruitment, Wenger built the first team who could consistently compete with Ferguson in the Premier League era. Winning three league titles and three FA Cups in his first eight seasons in charge, including a historic invincible season which made Wenger a god in North London. However, their 2006 move to the Emirates brought a change in fortunes for the club. Reduced investment into the squad due to having to pay back extremely high loans, in addition to the rise of Chelsea and Man City, saw their power fall. Not winning a league title in his final 14 seasons in charge, and rarely even challenging for the league, finishing second just once in the new stadium. He also made it clear to fans that their aim had changed from winning titles to finishing in the top four, and he achieved this goal on most occasions, until his final two years in charge, the first of which was also the first season they finished below Tottenham in 22 years. This period was the peak of the Arsenal fan TV fad, and the Emirates had become one of the most toxic stadiums in the country. Flans were split on Wenger, with Wenger out becoming an iconic line in football social media. Wenger retired at the end of the 17-18 season after the board told him he should leave despite him wanting to remain for his final year of his contract. Although results were at a two-decade low, investment into the squad had begun to return as the pressure of repaying debts had begun to ease. There was some optimism within Arsenal fan base that a new face could re-energise the club despite scepticism around the club's owners. The heavy favourite to replace Wenger was in fact former captain Mikel Arteta. However, the Spaniard pulled his name out of the race, citing he was not ready for the job and wanted to spend more time working under Guardiola at Manchester City. Maybe a sign of mismanagement within the Gunners at the time, the club then moved away from a young, exciting coach who knew the club inside and out for an experienced coach with no experience in English football, only months after being sacked by PSG. It was, of course, Unai Emery. Despite winning three Europa Leagues at Sevilla, his time at PSG had seen his reputation full and had a stigma of playing boring football at the time. Most fans were underwhelmed by his appointment, but a 22-game unbeaten run near the beginning of his time in charge brought optimism. However, this was a mirage, and the season ended up in misery, finishing one point off their arch-rivals Tottenham to miss out on the top four, and then losing to fellow London side Chelsea 4-1 in the Europa League final in Baku. He would be sacked in November the following season, following a poor start to the season, and would now be replaced with Arteta, who was now ready to coach the team. There were expectations that Arteta, who had been working under Guardiola, would bring beautiful football back to North London, but it was not immediately visible. Often playing a back five and playing on the counter-attack, Arteta's Arsenal were not looking like a club on the up. Back-to-back 8th place finishes had lots of fans doubting the Spaniard. But an FA Cup win in his first season, bringing through young players from their academy like Saka and Smith Rowe, in addition to an improvement in results and style in the back end of the second season in charge, saw the club back him for another season. The appointment of former Invincible Edu as director of football also began to see the club's transfer business improve, with a structure now in place for Arsenal to thrive. Despite bottling the end of their last two seasons, the young Arsenal side had risen from 8th to fifth and then to second in the league. Despite stumbling, I think it's fair to say they've replaced their icon fairly well in not as long a time as many of the other clubs I've mentioned today. There are obviously many more examples of iconic managers over the course of football history. However, out of the 10 managers I've discussed today, six of those clubs have not won a league title since they've left and Manchester United went 26 years after Busby. Liverpool will be hoping to not face the same fate when replacing Jurgen Klopp this summer. And the history of Liverpool will tell us that replacing an iconic manager with someone who knows the club is probably the best idea.